Okay, in this lesson, we're going to talk about drained and undrained loading conditions. And this is a really important concept in soil mechanics that distinguishes soil from some other kinds of material like uh, steel, let's say, just the bulk material. So as a particulate material, soil tends to change volume when it's sheared. All right, it may grow or it may shrink, but when it's sheared, it will change volume. And you may have uh, experienced this before if you have, say, a, a bucket full of loose sand and you kind of shake the bucket or you kick the side of it, you'll see that the soil surface settles down, right? So by kicking it, you're shearing it, and then the particles get packed more tightly as a result. So um, let's talk about um, what happens to soil when it's sheared. So here we have a, a soil specimen, this little square, and it's initially dense. So the particles are initially pretty tightly packed in here. You'll notice that there's not a lot of void space, right? So I'm kind of drawing in the void spaces. Um, the particles are tightly packed and you know there's just not a lot of void space in this one. And then we have vertical and horizontal as our coordinate system. So there's a vertical effective stress and a horizontal effective stress acting on the soil element. And its initial height is H. All right, now if we were to shear it by keeping the vertical effective stress and horizontal effective stress constant, but adding uh, shear stress in the horizontal and vertical planes, tau HV, what will happen to the soil is that the particles will actually grow. No, the particles won't grow. The way that they move past each other means that like, you know, this particle right here has to move up and go over that particle. Like, as I've drawn here, it's, it's moved in an upward direction. So in order for these particles to rearrange themselves to accommodate the shear strain, they will grow. And shear strain here is, is gamma. So it's basically this angle in this simple case, right? That's shear strain. Um, so we get this delta H. The soil has grown, it's gone up vertically. And then there's horizontal displacement too, use of H, right? So the soil becomes looser, and when a soil becomes looser, we call it dilated. Okay, dilation is, is growing volumetrically, whereas contraction or contractiveness is shrinking volumetrically. So let's take a look at what happens if a soil is initially loose. So we have now the same initial height. I've only drawn four soil particles in here to indicate that they're looser, and you've got this big void space right there in the middle and similar big void spaces around all of the particles. So uh, now when you shear this soil, same vertical effective stress and horizontal effective stress initially, and we add tau HV, um, what happens now is that this particle will tend to kind of pop down into this open space left between the particles below. And so when you shear it, the soil contracts, it shrinks, it becomes denser, right? So that's a contractive soil. So as a general rule of thumb, soil that's initially dense tends to be dilative, tends to grow during shear. Soil that's initially loose tends to be contractive or tends to, um, you know, shrink during shear. So let's, let's put in some definitions here. Um, first, epsilon V is the volumetric strain. And in the case that we're talking about, there's no horizontal strain, it's only vertical. So uh, I don't know if I failed to mention that. We're assuming that the horizontal dimensions here stay the same. So like that length is equal to that length, that length is equal to that length. The only strains that are happening here are shear strain and vertical strain. And so the vertical strain is equal to the volumetric strain. There's no other horizontal strain component going on. So uh, in that case, vertical strain, volumetric strain is delta H over H. And remember in soil mechanics, we use a compression positive sign convention. So this delta H is positive. The delta H that shrinks and causes the soil to compress, that's positive. This delta H is negative. So the delta H that causes the soil to grow or dilate will be a negative one. Um, okay, and then there's an important concept called dilatancy. And that's um, the ratio of the volumetric strain rate to the deviatoric strain rate. 
you can think of deviatoric strain as basically being shear strain in this case, right? It's a, it, that's a useful thing to, uh, a useful way to conceptualize it. So epsilon v dot is the volumetric strain rate. Epsilon q dot is the deviatoric strain rate. The reason we pose dilatancy in terms of rates is that if the soil is currently in the act of growing, the dilatancy is going to be a big negative number, right? Because epsilon v dot would be negative. If the soil is growing, the volumetric strain rate is negative. Um, if the soil is shrinking, then the dilatancy will be positive. Um, and so soil doesn't continue to grow or shrink forever. Eventually, all of the volumetric expansion or contraction finishes and the soil is happy just to continue shearing at some volume change, at some void ratio, right? So dilatancy evolves over time and therefore we define it based on the rate rather than the overall volume change um, numbers. All right, and then gamma is the horizontal displacement divided by the, uh, well, it's the horizontal displacement gradient with respect to the vertical, it's the shear strain. All right, now let's talk about these terms drained and undrained. That's, this is the title of this section. So these terms refer to the volumetric boundary conditions that exist as the soil is sheared. So think of, I know this is a little bit weird to think about. We usually think about boundary conditions as being um, you know, displacements or forces that are related to shear. These are volumetric boundary conditions, which are equally valid to think about. So for drained loading, the soil can freely change volume during shear. If you shear the soil and it wants to dilate, it, it just dilates. It's free to do that. There's nothing preventing that from happening. Uh, if it wants to contract, it will contract and shrink and nothing prevents that from happening. Undrained, the soil cannot change volume during shear. Now there's some loading condition imposed on the soil that prevents it from changing volume. So if you're shearing a soil that wants to dilate, now you're preventing that dilation from happening by adjusting the vertical force so that the displacement stays zero during shear. That's one way to think about undrained loading. Um, and I, I realize that these are a little bit uh, confusing sometimes, but anyway, drained and undrained loading conditions can be achieved in the laboratory. So um, we can control the boundary conditions either by filling up the soil with water and then closing drainage valves so that no water can get in or out. Uh, or here's another way of thinking about it. I've sketched a little, um, a, a little diagram here that shows a couple of actuators. So the hydraulic actuator is simply a, um, a cylinder with a piston inside of it and then there's oil inside on the top of that piston. And by adjusting the oil pressure, you can move the piston up or down. And um, I've also drawn some sensors in here. So here's a load cell. The purpose of the load cell is just to measure force. And then here's an LVDT, which measures displacement. Um, L LVDT stands for Linear Variable Differential Transformer. And it basically uses coils of wire and inductance around a ferromagnetic core to measure displacement. Pretty cool sensor. So we have a vertical hydraulic actuator, and then we also have a horizontal hydraulic actuator with corresponding load cell and LVT over here. And then we have this soil specimen down here, and the soil specimen has a top cap right there, and then a bottom cap that's fixed to a, uh, a bench, let's say. And so now we have a system that we can control, right? We can tell the horizontal actuator to do some stuff, we can tell the vertical actuator to do some stuff, and um, let, let's assume that the soil can't change, um, there's no horizontal strain, right? So the soil can't just bulge out and fall out of this thing. We've constrained it in there in some way that allows it to deform horizontally but not flow out in, in you know, these directions. All right, so the horizontal actuator controls the shear force or displacement. The vertical actuator controls the volumetric force or displacement, right? We can move this a vertical actuator up or down and that would change the volume of the soil. So I think this is a really useful way to think about how we might control volumetric boundary conditions in a laboratory setting.
when we get into seepage in the next section, we'll talk about how these boundary conditions might come about from natural conditions that exist in the soil, but we can't really get there until we talk about hydraulic conductivity and, and seepage. So anyway, we'll leave that for later. For now, this is perfectly, this, this analogy right here is perfectly suited to establish what we mean. So if we want to do drain loading, what we would do is tell the hydraulic actuator to keep the load cell having a constant vertical force. So we put some vertical force by adjusting the oil pressure behind this piston, and then basically that oil pressure will stay the same, right? We're not gonna allow it to change during loading. And what that means is that this top cap is free to move up if the soil is dilative, free to move down if it's contractive, and we can measure that displacement using the LVDT, right? So we, we are measuring the load in the load cell, and we're telling the hydraulic pressure basically to stay the same. So the hydraulic control system is saying adjust the oil pressure so that that load remains the same. Okay, so that would be drain loading. We could do it differently. We could do undrain loading and that's where we apply an initial force in the load cell, some initial displacement, and then at the time we decide to move the horizontal actuator, instead of telling the vertical actuator to keep the pressure constant or to keep the load constant, we could tell it, keep the LVDT constant. Okay, don't let that actuator move up or down, just lock it in place, and then we'll measure the load, right? Now the load is gonna change, because if the soil naturally wanted to move down, in order to keep the piston from moving down, we're gonna have to ease up on that pressure a little bit, right? So the soil will kind of settle away from the top cap. If the soil is trying to grow, we're going to have to increase the oil pressure to prevent that growth from happening. So I, I think that that's a uh, sort of a good way to think about how we might control these volumetric boundaries. So let's take a look at a soil that is initially dense and what would happen to it if we used the drained or undrained control configuration for this, for this particular soil. All right, so if it's initially dense, here we've got our five soil particles in there, not a lot of void space. Remember, this one would try to grow in drain loading, so delta H is upward, that's a negative delta H, right? Volumetric expansion is negative, um, so delta H is less than zero in this case. Uh, so we've already gone through that. Now, what if we loaded that soil, but instead of keeping sigma V naught prime constant under drain loading, what if we kept the vertical displacement constant? So you can see this little dotted line going across. Now this, this soil element is the exact same height as this soil element. It's just been deformed in shear, but the volume has stayed the same. Well, what will happen is that in order to suppress the tendency of this soil to grow vertically, we're going to have to increase the vertical force, right? So the, the load will increase and the vertical LVDT will stay the same. If we didn't increase the vertical load, the soil would heave up and the LVDT would move, right? So in order to suppress that tendency, we've got to increase the load. So you end up with sigma V naught prime plus a delta sigma V, and the delta sigma V is the change in vertical load to suppress that dilation from happening. So delta sigma V is greater than zero, delta H is less than zero um, for initially dense material. So, I, sorry, I should say, if the initially dense material is undrained, then uh, may, maybe I should write these in, actually. Delta H is equal to zero because we're controlling that, and delta sigma V is, is greater than zero because in order to keep the displacement zero, we have to increase the force. Uh, similarly, over here, for drain loading, delta H is less than zero, delta sigma V is equal to zero, right? So now we're controlling the vertical stress and letting the displacement do what it's gonna do. Now what if we do that for a soil that's initially loose, all right? Um, so this would be a contracted soil, only four soil particles in here. If we were to shear it drained, it would settle, right? It's gonna decrease volume. These particles will be more densely packed at the end of shear. So uh, in this case, delta H is greater than zero, right? Because we've, we've controlled vertical pressure, delta sigma V is equal to zero. Um, 
and the soil wanted to settle. And of course, we let it settle and measured that settlement. So delta H is greater than zero. Um, conversely, if we go to undrain loading, now the fact that the soil wants to settle means that as we're shearing it, we have to back off that vertical load in order to keep the LVBT constant, right? If we, if we let it, if we kept the vertical stress the same, it would settle. Therefore, to keep the vertical, uh, to keep the vertical displacement zero, we have to unload it. And so, so delta sigma V is less than zero. And here, delta H is equal to zero. All right, there is another um, physical um, tool we can use to sort of describe this dilatancy or contraction behavior. And I'm usually doing this in a classroom where I'm far away from a lot of students, so I don't know how well they can see it. But if you put your knuckles together like this to where the bump of one knuckle falls in sort of the trough of your other hand's knuckles, okay, that's like dense soil particles. And then if you move your hands relative to each other, your knuckles have to kind of pull apart, your hands pull apart and the knuckles right up on top of each other. So that's initially dense, that's drain loading, right? I'm allowing my hands to separate. If on the other hand, I told my arms like, keep that, you know, don't let your, um, don't let your hands separate, but still shear them. I could, oh, I'd have to really push hard to keep my hands together, right? And I can't really do it, you know, it's really hard to do that. They have to separate to allow my knuckles to move over each other. I guess if I was really strong and kind of dumb, I could keep my hands locked and then I would break my knuckles as I've slid my hands past each other. So that's dense. You could also put your knuckles in an initially loose configuration, like this, right? Where the two, the, the bump on one knuckle is right on top of the bump of the other knuckle. And now, if you were to shear them, they come together. So that's like contraction. And this one I can do. If I were to try and do undrained loading, they would separate, right? My, my hands have stayed the same distance. So I can initially push on them like that. And then when I shear, they're, they're not even touching anymore, right? So that's another thing you can try. In fact, you should try it right now. I don't know, maybe people are watching and you'd be embarrassed to be going like this. but. At some point, give it a try. It's a way of making the, these concepts have some, some physical meaning, meanings and kinesthetic.